Welcome everyone um, to our Youth Democracy Series. Uh, today we're doing Get Out the Count uh, with special guest Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici and with Annie Naranjo Rivera from Unite Oregon. Um, so uh, we're just going to ask folks to um, put yourself on mute uh, when speakers are speaking. Um, and you can keep your video on as long as, you know, you're not doing anything too distracting. Um, and uh, just enjoy the webinar. If you have questions um, as we're going, uh, you can type them into the chat box. We are going to have some time for questions. So you can just put them in there as we go and we'll get to um, as many as we can. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna kick it off and uh, over to Casey Hansen, the chair of the Democratic Party of Oregon. Casey. Great, thank you, Katie. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate everybody, appreciate everybody being on the call today. Of course, particularly uh, Congressman, Congresswoman uh, Suzanne Bonamici and our uh, United Oregon Statewide Census Equity Coordinator, Coordinator Annie Naranjo Rivera. Um, but it's really important that you're on and that you recognize how important a census is for Oregon because the census data brings in vital money, vital federal money to the programs you know, we cherish in this state. So you as leaders, you as long eater, young leaders, be paying attention to this and, and uh, spreading the word on it is absolutely just vital. Uh, that you have taken the time to be on this call um, uh, speaks very, well, it speaks volumes about your leadership. So thank you again. Okay, so let's get right into the details. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and once again, Unite Oregon's statewide census equity coordinator, Annie Naranjo Rivera. Annie, take it away, my friend. Annie, we can't hear you. There you go. Okay. Hi, I'm Annie Naranjo Rivera. I'm the statewide census equity coordinator for Unite Oregon. And um, I am going to be doing an abbreviated version of the Census 101 presentation. So by the end of this, you will know some basic details about the census and why it's important for us here in Oregon. Um, so we are part of, um, well, let me tell you a little bit about Unite Oregon first. Um, I wanna welcome folks from across the state. Um, we have offices across the state in um, rural Oregon, in the urban areas. I'm all the way out here um, on the Oregon coast and it's a little bit gray outside. I don't know what the weather's like where you are, but we wanted to find out um, where people were coming from and what part of the state you're in. So if you would drop in the chat your name and where you're calling from, um, then we'll kind of get an idea who's on the call. Um, and the chat box is at the bottom of your screen um, in the center, so um, that everyone can find it. Um, so let's see who we've got. Oh, somebody just dropped in the chat. Katie from Portland, welcome. Casey's calling in from Gresham. Let's see. I know we've got folks around the metro area for sure. Um, Congresswoman, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Washington County. Okay, great. And I'm uh, in um, Congressional District 5 over here on the coast. So great, it's nice to see people from all over. Um, if we wanna move to the next slide, Unite Oregon is uh, the organization that I work for. And um, we are led by people of color, immigrants, refugees, and rural communities and people experiencing poverty. Um, and we do justice work. Um, we work across the state to build an intercultural movement for justice. So um, we have over 13,000 supporters and members across Oregon. And um, we're not necessarily affiliated with a political party, but um, we do progressive justice work. So you've probably seen us or heard about us. And if you haven't, definitely um, find out more about what we're up to. Um, because we're doing great work, including census education and outreach. So we can go to the next slide. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a community organizer, and I have been doing this work since I was about your age, some of you who are calling in. 
So if you ever think you're too small to make a difference, you're not. Um, <laughs> so I've been doing grassroots organizing and political work, running campaigns um, in labor and on environmental campaigns um, and with community organizations for 17 years. And I want you all to think about your own power that you have, because the fact that you're on this call means you care about your community um, and you can have an impact. So um, we're part of the We Count Oregon Coalition. Um, this is a coalition that's been put together of um, other organizations that are primarily led by um, people of color. And the reason why we wanted to do that is um, to build a movement um, that is different and more diverse than what we've seen in a lot of the organizing that we've seen around our state. Um, so as you can see, these are the census equity coordinators from our partner organizations, who I'll point out in a minute. Um, that's a really diverse, amazing group of people. Um, and our uh, objective is to get this message about the importance of the census out to communities that sometimes don't receive the messaging for a lot of reasons. Maybe it's because they're rural and it's harder to get to them. Um, maybe it's because they're living on a Native American reservation um, and the messaging isn't getting there. Maybe it's because English isn't their first language. And so sometimes the materials aren't accessible to them. Um, maybe it's because they're a renter and their census form didn't come to the right address um, or got caught up in the mail. So there are a lot of reasons why um, people don't get accurate information about the census. And the point of bringing this coalition together is to combat that um, with information coming from trusted community messengers. So um, next slide. These are some of the organizations that are working on this project. Um, and hopefully you've heard of some of us. Um, Apano, Oregon Futures Lab, Pelth, Causa, Raices, Cat Action, Unite Oregon, East County Rising, uh, NEA Family Center, the Latino Network, Forward Together, and Pacoon. And um, we're all working pretty hard to make this happen. Our mission, um, well, we're a community-led effort working to make sure that hard-to-count communities, which is a, an actual term, the hard-to-count communities, including people of color, immigrants, renters, rural communities, and children under five, know about and take the 20 cent, 2020 census. So what is the census? Why are we doing this presentation? Um, well, the census is the process of counting everybody um, in the country, in our entire country. You don't have to be a citizen. If you're here, you count. Um, and every 10 years, it happens. Um, Jonathan, if you want to go to the next. Um, it's mandated by the Constitution, and it determines where and how federal dollars are allocated. So every 10 years this happens, the last one was in 2010, 2020 this year. Um, it looks a little bit different than um, previous years. And um, we'll talk about that in a second. So who has a guess when the first census was conducted? If you guess the correct answer, you're gonna win a prize. And my friend Katie over at the DPL will get it to you. It's a surprise prize. Um, who knows when the first census was conducted? Drop it down below in the chat. See if anyone can get it. If you have already taken Census 101, you should already know this. So you might win the prize. Is any, are people able to use the chat? Is anyone having trouble? Okay, somebody just got it. They messaged me privately. Duke Harjo. Woo. Correct. 1790. Nice job. So um, Katie will connect with you after this um, to get you your prize. So if you want to go to the next slide, this is a timeline of um, the history of the census. So Duke was correct that in 1790, the first census ever was taken and enumerators traveled on horses um, from house to house to take the census. Um, the enumerators identified who was the head of the household by name and took account of free white men, women, other free people, and enslaved people. So those were the categories in the first census. And you can see as the timeline goes on that things improve a little bit. Um, so in 1870 was the first census to distinguish between different people of color, Black, Chinese, and American Indian. 
and previously you could only identify as white, black, or mulatto. Um, in 1960, the Census Bureau mailed out questionnaires to households for the first time, so it would be in your mailbox, um, but the completed forms still had to be picked up in person by an enumerator. Um, and I don't think they were using horses anymore at that point. Um, in 1970, the first self-enumeration by mail started to happen. So you could fill out your own form and um, you could send it back. So households in metro areas received the census questionnaire and then they could return it on their own by mail. Um, and then in 1990, a huge step happened. Electronic data collection methods were introduced. So um, I like to joke around and say, that's the year they got rid of all the file cabinets. <laughs> um, because if you can imagine all of the paperwork they had to keep before electronic data collection was available, it's overwhelming to imagine. Um, and this year is huge because this year is the first year to allow online self-response. And that's being promoted as the primary method of enumeration. So people are being encouraged to do that if they're able. Um, to do it online. So next, just an important note, as you're talking to people, I mentioned that you're important and you're the future. Um, you're a trusted messenger. And so an important thing to know is that all of the data for the census, it's confidential and it's protected by Title 13. So Title 13 means that private information is never published. The Census Bureau collects information to produce statistics. The employees are sworn to protect confidentiality, and anyone who violates the law will face severe penalties, as you can see there. So um, they're sworn to protect the data for life. Even if they no longer work for the Census Bureau, they still have to protect the data, and that's the law. Um, also important to know is that there's no citizenship question on the 2020 Census form. Yay! <laughs> So the Trump administration had threatened to put a, a citizenship question on the census. And obviously with the climate that we're currently living in, um, there's a lot of hate rhetoric, um, Islamophobia and racism that's rampant in our society right now. Um, so a lot of people are living in fear. So it's important for folks to know that there won't be a citizenship question on the census um, and that it is completely safe to take it, so. Um, the census is about building power, um, and we're going to talk in a second about what that means, but um, it's building power for our communities, um, making sure that everyone is represented and that we get the resources we need. So what's at stake for Oregon? Um, $13 billion. That's a lot of money. Um, and, you know, Congresswoman Bonamici works really hard to make sure that we get the things that we need here in Oregon um, accomplished. But that money um, goes to programs like Medicaid, Head Start, roads, schools, hospitals, um, school lunch programs, unemployment, Section 8 programs for seniors, and programs for veterans. So especially now with coronavirus and COVID happening, people need these resources more than ever. So it's going to be even more important than before that we get an accurate count and get those funds for our state. Um, there's a list of the programs there that I just mentioned. And there's something else at stake. Oregon currently has five congressional districts. I live in District 5, currently represented by Congressman um, Schrader and um, Congresswoman Bonamici is from Congressional District 3. But we could get an extra congressional district. And um, so we could get an additional seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. And so here we see a picture of AOC. I think you guys might recognize this woman. <laughs> She's kind of a rising star in the party. Um, we could potentially have our own new AOC from Oregon. Um, we don't know who um, we might have representing us, but we could get a sixth seat, which means more of a voice for our folks here in Oregon um, when they go to Congress. So just to review ways to self-respond to the census, you can mail in your census form, you can call it in, or you can do it online. And online is the easiest way. It takes five minutes or so. Um, so we're encouraging people to do that if at all possible. Um, yeah, so next slide. An enumerator is 
you've heard me mention it, the person who goes door to door to collect the census forms. So if you're sitting at home, and you forget about your census form, you don't do it, somebody's supposed to come to your door and check in with you and get you to do it um, with them. Obviously with what's happening with COVID right now, um, with the coronavirus, a lot of those programs are um, delayed. So the self-response period has been extended to August 14th. So you and your friends and family have until August 14th to do it. Um, we're not sure when the enumerators will be safely able to go out. So please tell folks that you know um, to do it online. Um, and that way we won't have to have um, enumerators um, be the primary way that that happens. So this is a census helpline. Anyone can call this. Um, there's translation available in a long list of languages, um, which for UNITE, we work with a lot of immigrant and refugee populations. So obviously getting translation and information in the proper language is important, but maybe you know somebody who needs translation. Um, maybe you know someone that has a question or didn't receive their form. You can call this number. It's 1-844-330-2020. Um, the line is already active, so the slide was made before it was, but um, they're ready to go, they're available, um, and please pass the number on to anyone who needs any um, help. And without further ado, I cannot wait to hear from Congresswoman Bonamici. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for all the work that you're doing to uh, represent our communities. Of course, thank you so much, everyone. I'm really glad you're all on this really critical call. Thank you to, to Katie and Casey Hansen and Annie. What a wonderful presentation. Thanks to the Democratic Party of Oregon for bringing us all together. I've been in Congress um, about eight years now. It went by pretty quickly. But before that, I was in the Oregon legislature. Uh, and I focused on education issues um, and then ran for Congress. Um, now I serve on the Education and Labor Committee, as well as the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, and the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Was working on so many important issues, and well, now like all of you, I'm home with my team, working with my colleagues on calls and Zoom conferences, and doing all we can to help our families, our healthcare workers, our first responders, everyone out there on the front line, our small businesses that are so important to our economy. Well, I, re I re represent Northwest Oregon. Um, it's actually the first congressional district and it has part of Portland. Earl Blumenauer is um, representing the third district. He has some of Portland, but the district I'm honored to represent goes all the way out to the coast. So it has all of uh, Clatsop and Columbia counties, Yamhill County, all of Washington County and part of Multnomah County. And it is one fifth of the state. And the census is really important as you heard from Annie for a couple of reasons. First, it determines who I represent and who represents you, but also for all of the funding that Annie mentioned that is so important. A lot of that funding comes to our state based on population. So back in 2010, at the time of the last census, I was in the state legislature. And I was in the Senate in 2011 and I chaired the redistricting committee. So I know how important it is. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the first thing that happens is that every 10 years when we get those new census numbers, that happens across the country. And when we get the total number for the whole country, then the very first step is that the U.S. Census Bureau decides how many districts each state gets. And as Annie was saying, we are very likely to get another congressional district. So we will have six instead of five. That all depends on getting good numbers and accurate numbers that count everybody. So once we get the total number of people in Oregon, and this is again why the census is so important, then the legislature, we have legislative redistricting here, then the legislature takes that total number and then they divide it by the number of congressional districts. So in 2011, it was divided by five because we had five. Next time we expect it will be divided by six. And so they have to draw the districts so that every congressional district has the same number of people as of the date of the census. So that is so important and why we need everybody to be counted so we can make sure that the representation is equal so that we can make sure that 
we know who is living where, so that helps us represent you. So again, it's really important to, to participate in the census. Some of you may be wondering, we heard that April 1st is the census date. Does that mean it's too late for us to fill out a census? And the answer is no, April 1st is the date that's considered the date when you fill out the census or the date when you count the number of people in your house. So say for example, on April 1st, five people lived in your house, but then two of them moved out on April 2nd. You still count the five people in your house. If you move to a new house on March 31st, you still count where you are on April 1st, even if you lived in the other place before. So April 1st is the date that you count um, for accuracy, but you still have time to fill out your census, and it's so important to do that. So again, thank you for your interest in this. It's really, really critical. Um, I, I hope that all of you um, are participating in the census if you haven't already. And also spread the word to your friends and your neighbors. As Annie was saying, there is no citizenship question and the information has to be kept confidential. So now more than ever, it's important to be counted. So thank you so much for being on the call and for uh, your interest in this really important issue that as we heard has been going on since 1790. Uh, and I think we have time for questions and I look forward to, uh, to answering them. Yeah, who has a question for Congresswoman Bonamici? And I think everyone's chat should be working. I think we had a little technical Great. problem. That okay, terrific. Yeah. Anyone? Questions? I think there's one in the chat. There is one. Oh, do they ask income questions on the census? I was going to give that to you, Annie, in a minute if we, um, okay. or any, and, unless you want to answer that, Congresswoman Bonamici. What is my favorite part of my job? Yeah, your favorite oh, part there's, job. there's so many. I have to say mm -hmm. that there are many favorite parts of my job, but what I really, really like doing is getting things done for the people I represent. When I'm here in Oregon talking to people and we find out what's on people's minds, what they need, what policies will make a difference. One of my main goals when I went to Congress was to get rid of No Child Left Behind. So the day that um, I got to stand with the president not the current president, but President Obama, when he signed that into law, that was really a highlight for me. So it's really making a difference for the people I represent. Um, we just passed um, a bill called the Older Americans Act that helps with our, our seniors, um, you know, grandparents and parents, like uh, Meals on Wheels and wonderful programs that help people in need. And we got that done and it really feels good to get those things done. I also really like doing town hall meetings. Um, I've been having them on the telephone, but I really like being out in the community and hearing directly from the people I'm honored to represent. Thank you. Um, great. How is COVID affecting what's happening in DC? Oh boy, it's really affecting what we're doing. We're having ongoing conversations, of course, about how we address the really critical needs with our healthcare workers, with that personal protective equipment that's so important for the people who are on the front lines. Um, how do we make sure we have enough testing? So we're working really hard on all those issues. I spend a lot of time talking with my colleagues and communicating with them, um, but we aren't physically in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, it's you know not not the safest to, to be out and traveling we need to be home whenever we can so we are all ready ready to go to Washington DC if and when they need us to vote but right now we're working remotely and my staff is working remotely but working hard thank you for your question great um, was there another question I thought I saw um, is do you represent Beaverton in your district yes I represent all of Washington County all of Clatsop County, Columbia County, Yamhill County, and um, part of Multnomah County. So yes, definitely Beaverton is in, in the district I represent. That's where my office is, Beaverton. Great. Um, what, um, do you know what's happened to everyone who needs a test? Can they, can they get tested for uh, COVID? Mm, as far as I know, not quite yet. Um, we are, that is improving though greatly. At one point, I, I think the president and the administration were saying anyone who wants a test can get it, but that's not really the case. We have 
through our healthcare experts, been making it a priority to test our healthcare workers and people who are vulnerable. But we are improving now and getting more and more tests, which will be wonderful to be able to increase and, and improve testing, make sure that is more available and accessible. Um, and also faster. So there's a lot of work being done, um, both by our researchers and by private companies, you know, both at, at the National Institutes of Health, the federal level, but also um, our private companies that are working on that testing and trying to get it out as quickly as they can to all of our healthcare providers to make sure people can get tested. Makes a big difference. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Vivian wants to know, how long do we have to stay inside? Oh, I wish I knew the answer to that. But I, one, one thing I, I do know is the longer people stay inside, the more we can bend that curve down. Uh, with, with the coronavirus or COVID, we know that people can be spreading it without having symptoms, which is, that's what's made it really, really challenging. And that's why it's so important for people to stay in and, and, and stay safe so they don't spread it. And once we get a lot more testing, we'll be able to determine who, um, who is safe or who has either passed it or uh, has already recovered it or who, who actually has it. But until then, it's really important. I know how hard it is. Um, it is okay to go out for walks, try to you know, make sure you're keeping your distance from people when you're outside, but get some fresh air when you can. But uh, the, more, the, the, the more we really follow the guidance of our healthcare professionals and stay inside, uh, it's going to shorten the time uh, because it's going to stop the spread. So thanks for that question. But I, I know it's really, really hard, but it's, it's important to, to make sure we're doing everything we can. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Moving on today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, okay. And then I think we have a couple of census questions. I'm going to um, punt to Annie. Um, so um, one of them was, do they ask income questions on the census? Um, really quickly, I just wanted to say um, thanks to Candy for dropping the um, link for how you can find out which district you live in. And I misspoke. Um, Congressional District 1 is, um, is Congresswoman Bonamici's district. So I'm sorry about that, folks. Um, I think I need more copy. So um, will they be asking about income? No, they won't. Um, you don't have to answer any questions about income. The questions are pretty straightforward. Um, there's like name, other people who live in your household. Um, there's some race questions, um, address, phone number is optional, and so on. Um, so you don't have to answer questions about income. Great. Good question. Um, and then Casey said, um, I am LGBT and there's no census question that addresses that. Is there a way for someone to write their status in in another category? Yeah, I'm sorry about that, Casey. Um, so as you guys could see from the timeline, the census has evolved and it is still evolving. So there are definitely things um, about the current census that are not ideal um, or they're not perfect yet. Um, so now is the time, as we say, to start lobbying for census 2030. Um, but there isn't a way to say that. Um, if you do, like, let's say you're in a partnership, like a domestic partnership, there is a way to put like that that person is your significant other, like when you're doing relationships. Um, but there isn't a way to answer that. And another thing is the gender question. You either have to choose male or female. And so obviously that doesn't include our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters and siblings. Um, so we want to keep pushing the envelope on that and especially here in Oregon um, I'd say we're fairly progressive on pushing the envelope on those issues so let's advocate now and get that included in 2030. Great thank you yeah. um, and then we have another question from Morgan uh, how do you ensure the accuracy of the census count are there checks to verify the numbers? That's a really good question Morgan um, so the count we know actually is not accurate. Um, there's usually an undercount, which means there are people that couldn't be reached at all. Um, so that's part of the reason that we brought this coalition together, um, is to try to reach out to pockets of people that get forgotten or that have a lower rate of being counted. So we know for sure that a lot of immigrant populations don't get counted. We know for sure that a lot of people of color don't get counted. A lot of children under five are left off. 
a lot of Native Americans are left off. Um, a lot of rural folks are left off. So we're trying to combat that. Um, in terms of like accuracy, once you're counted, like if I am counted here and I'm a student and my mom also accidentally counts me back home, the Census Bureau will integrate those and they will remove duplicates. So um, they do check through to try to maintain like accurate records and make sure people aren't double counted. And there's actually a, a question on the census that says, is anyone in your household a student or in the military, et cetera, um, so that they can hopefully help to like flag that and make sure that there's um, as accurate account as possible. But um, as I mentioned with coronavirus, um, there's a lot of delay in what the counting plan was. So we don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but we do know that like the houseless population, for instance, they're normally counted at a certain time and in a certain way. And so right now that's delayed. Um, and so like getting an accurate count of the homeless population, people experiencing homelessness right now is gonna be really hard during the middle of a pandemic. So we can expect like realistically an undercount um, and just do whatever you can to get out the word to folks that you know. Yeah. Great. Um, I have one last question, I think, unless there's any more um, that was sent to me. It's, um, why is it important to um, identify race on the census? That is a really good question. Um, so as you could see, diversity is important to us um, as part of the We Count campaign. Um, there are a lot of reasons, and one of them is um, that we deserve to be counted. Um, we deserve to be seen. So I'm the child of a Cuban refugee. Um, and it's important to me that our communities are seen and represented and that they understand that they deserve a voice. Um, you don't need to be a citizen here to um, be a contributing member of society and to be deserving of resources um, and part of the fabric that is you know, our world here. Um, so I'd say number one, representation um, as an answer to that. Also, there are more practical things than that. Um, for instance, we have a member of Unite Oregon who said, you know, when I first came here um, as a, a refugee, I went to Portland State University and um, my language was one of the options that I could choose and receive all my materials in that language and um, receive help right away. And it was really easy to navigate the forms. And the reason is because there's enough of account that her group of people were considered you know, um, on that form. So because of an accurate count, we knew, oh, hey, we need to have services available in this language. You know, it's a significant chunk of the population that needs resources. And that applies for public school too, you know, getting translators and services for parents and families. Um, and it touches a lot of other aspects of our society, so. Awesome, thank you, Annie. Um, so I think we have um, another slide that Jonathan's gonna put up. Um, we have some stuff for you all to do at home. Um, there's, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so Annie, you wanna go ahead? Okay, and so can we count on you? Um, if you all would take out your cell phone and text 3333, or text Oregon to 3333.9, so. Text the word Oregon to 33339. And um, you can follow the WeCountOregon.com link to our landing page and sign up for updates, um, including like census details, how you can get involved, that kind of stuff. Um, we will probably have some more webinars coming up since we're having to adapt our campaign to the virtual uh, reality of coronavirus, COVID-19. So, um, we had a great one on Census Day with Governor Brown, and um, we anticipate doing more events like that. So stay tuned for those updates. And All right, next slide. Next. Yeah, great. And we have another call to action as well. Um, so, you know, make sure that your household fills out the census. So talk to your parents, your family, um, all of your friends, et cetera. Make sure people fill out the census. Um, kind of a fun thing to do would be um, if you can text five of your friends right now and challenge them to ask their families to fill out the census um, and make sure that they're doing that. 
and then ask those friends to text five more friends um, so we can really get um, everyone to fill out the census. Um, another fun thing is that you can, um, you know, again, you know, talk to your parents and everything, but you can post on social media a little clip or a photo um, and talk about why you want to be counted and why your family filled out the census. Um, and you can use the hashtag census challenge on your post um, as, as, you know, a hashtag. There's a lot of, um, a lot of other hashtags too, but that's a great one. And then you can also tag your friends that you text it and make sure they're all filling out the census. So that's it. Yeah. Great. Um, and then I'm going to give you all my email. If you have any other questions, my email is katie, K-A-T-I-E, at dpo.org. So if you have any questions for Annie or Congresswoman Bonamici or general things, um, feel free to email me, uh, katie at dpo.org. I can see the videos of folks watching and I'm just super impressed with all the young people that took time out of their day to be on this call. So thank you again so much. Yeah, this is Congresswoman Bonamici. Thank you again to everyone. And if you have questions for me, Katie, I can take those. I hope that's okay and pass them along to me or you can just contact my office directly. So thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. It's such an important time uh, to be uh, talking about the census. It really matters. Thanks again. Great, thank you. And I've got a question, so I'll answer a couple of these um, as, as people get off. But um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.